Second thing, this is an election year. Did you know that? Yes, it is. And uh, with any election year, I get a little bit nervous. And it's not um, because I'm nervous about what's going to happen with the election. I'm, I'm really not, okay? Um, but I get nervous because I wonder how people are going to interact with one another during this year leading up to and after the election. And I don't think I've ever done this before, but I want to recommend a sermon series if you are emotionally torn right now or worried or concerned. Um, Andy Stanley is a preacher at a large church in Atlanta, Georgia called North Point Church. And he gave a sermon series in January called Talking Points, the perfect blend of politics and religion. And in that sermon series, there's three messages that he gave. He talks about just keep, keeping the most important thing the most important thing. I'm rewording what he covers, but uh, really want to challenge you to take a look at that. Uh, you can find that link by searching it, or if you're on Facebook, you can find it. I linked to it this last week on my Facebook profile. So again, if you're nervous, if you're worried about some things, uh, consider taking a look at that. I've got something I want to share with you today here. Um, this will work. All right. Men, if you're married, it's winter time. Uh, you should consider buying your wife a Northeast sweatshirt. <laughs> it's not a shameless plug, okay? Well, maybe, but uh, because she might get cold, okay? So if she asks you to get her a Northeast sweatshirt, you should get her a Northeast sweatshirt. Um, if, she, if you don't, uh, well, she, she might want to get a wind chime. Um, I don't know, to let her know that it's windy outside, that maybe it's going to be a windy day, maybe it's going to be a cold, windy day. And uh, if you don't get her a wind chime, uh, well, your parents might get her a wind chime for Christmas. And if your parents get her a wind chime for Christmas, she's going to want you to hang it up. And if you don't hang it up soon enough, well, she's going to hang it up. And if she hangs it up, she might hang it up with a thumbtack right outside of your bedroom window. And if she hangs it up with a thumbtack right outside of your bedroom window, well, the day might come where you decide to start a sermon series on the Holy Spirit, talking about wind and fire. And if you teach a sermon title on uh, talking about wind and the Holy Spirit, well, that night at 2.30 a.m. in the morning, there might come a violent wind flowing through the valley. And if a violent wind comes flowing through the valley, it might just strain that wind chime thumbtack to its limit, and it might send that wind chime careening to the deck right outside of your window at 2.30 in the morning. And if that happens at 2.30 in the morning, you might get up and go outside to see what happened because uh, all of a sudden it got quiet. And if you go outside at 2.30 in the morning that night, you might realize it's 52 degrees outside at 2.30 in the morning last Sunday night or Monday morning, however you want to look at it. You, you know because maybe you went back inside and looked at your phone on the weather app and 52 degrees. And so maybe you would think, 52 degrees, I should go for a run. And then if that happens, you might realize it's 2.30 in the morning, and so you go back to sleep. And then if you go back to sleep, you might wake up later at 6 that morning to your wife saying, wow, uh, I'm a little nervous about when you preach on fire because uh, you preach on wind, and this is what happens. So men, um, buy your wife a Northeast sweatshirt. It's cold outside. And uh, anyway, we are, we are in this series called Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit because I think oftentimes we, we have a misunderstanding or maybe we're a little bit intimidated or just don't have any idea about God works through His Holy Spirit. And so uh, just a quick review. Last week, we talked about how the Old Testament word for spirit, most used most used word for spirit is the word ruach, and how the word in the New Testament most used for spirit is pneuma, how both of those words at their root have the word wind or breath of air. And so in John 3, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, and he talks about the Holy Spirit is like wind, and you don't know which way the wind is blowing, and you don't know where it's going. You, we know that we can't grab a hold of it. Uh, we can't see it, but you can feel its effect. So the wind is, is somewhat mysterious at times in how it interacts with us. And sometimes the Holy Spirit can be the same way. John chapter 16, Jesus said this, and again, we read this last week. It's for your good that I, Jesus, am going away. Well, why? 
Why, why, Jesus? Why would it be for our good that you are going away? How is that a benefit? Because, Jesus, you're right here comforting us and giving us answers and teaching us and being there to heal people. I mean, how, it, how can it be for our good? And then this is how he continues the second part of verse 7. Unless I go away, the advocate, talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so Jesus says, I'm going to leave. You're no longer going to have me right here with you. But that's for your benefit. And again, how, how can that be for our benefit? And it's as if Jesus is saying this, the Holy Spirit in you is better than Jesus right beside you. That was kind of a, a driving thought we had last week. And also we said this, unfortunately, even though the Holy Spirit in us is better than Jesus right next to us, oftentimes we don't look at the Holy Spirit as personal. We don't look at the Holy Spirit as a person. Instead, we think of the Holy Spirit as a what rather than a who. Or maybe another way to put it, we speak of the Holy Spirit as an it rather than a he. Or we relate to the Holy Spirit as a force rather than a friend. And as long as our thinking about the Holy Spirit is impersonal, then we're going to miss out on, on many things that God has designed for us. In fact, if he isn't personal to you, you'll miss out on the Holy Spirit's promptings in your life. And then we ended last week talking about this challenge, this take away challenge. I challenged you to pray this last week. Holy Spirit, help me to hear your promptings and to act. Help me to see how personal you are. I hope that you involved, I hope that you involved that prayer in, in your life this last week. Today I want to talk about the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is promised to us. And we're going to cover a few of the verses that we looked at last week and several others along with them. But I want to start with Acts chapter 1 verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, this is Jesus, after he uh, died and was buried and resurrected again. This is in the time after he was resurrected before he ascended to heaven. On one occasion he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Jesus is teaching them about the Holy Spirit all the time. And in this point he says, hey, don't you do anything. Don't try to do anything on your own. Wait for the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what their reaction was, I don't know if it was, you know, wow, when is the Holy Spirit going to come? How will we know when the Holy Spirit comes? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. It may be like a wind chime falling to the ground in the middle of the night and wakes you up. You'll know when the Holy Spirit comes. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So again, today I want to give you three promises of the Holy Spirit, talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. In this case, what does the Holy Spirit do for you? Number one, the Holy Spirit wants to comfort you. The Holy Spirit wants to comfort you. The longest section in Scripture about the Holy Spirit, teaching on the Holy Spirit, is in John chapter 14 and again in John chapter 16. Jesus is talking and teaching, and at the end of John chapter 16, he gives a very comforting truth. And this is something you might make a bumper sticker. Maybe you uh, tattoo it on your forearm, if that's your thing. I don't know. Uh, put it on your mirror. A very comforting truth. This is what he says. John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world you will have trouble. That's what he says. Now, he, he prefaces it with some encouraging things. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You're gonna have trouble. Anybody here this morning that has had a trouble-free life? If so, what are you doing, you know? Uh, I, none of us, right? Now, we might say, well, this person has experienced more difficulty than someone else or a different difficulty than someone else. Or I've, maybe we think I've experienced more difficulty, but without a fault, every single one of us has faced some kind of trouble. And I don't know where it started for you. I don't know if it was in your childhood, something happened or there was a difficult season of tragedy or, or something horrific happened to you that is unspeakable like you've you maybe you haven't even told anybody before I, I don't know when trouble started for you maybe it's been more recent something has happened it's just like what is what is going on I don't know how to make sense of this maybe your marriage in the early days or weeks or months 
uh, years even, was difficult, but you got through that. Or maybe for you, more recent things in your marriage have begun to happen that have been difficult and troublesome. I don't know when it happened for you. Maybe as a parent, you've had some difficulty with your kids, and there have been seasons, or maybe you're in it right now, and you're thinking, I just wish I could ship them off to some other part of the world, you know? Uh, I don't know when trouble started for you, but I do know this for every single one of us, we're going to face trouble in this world with, with practical things or health or work or school or loved ones or our, our own identity, whatever it may be. Every single one of us is going to face trouble. So the question is not, will I have trouble? But instead, where will I find comfort? Where am I going to find comfort? In the midst of difficulty, in trouble, where are you going to turn? Because every one of us seems to turn somewhere for comfort. And unfortunately, some people may turn to a drug or something in a bottle or some other sort of substance abuse or addictive behavior. Some people may pour themselves into their work and they become a workaholic because when I'm at work, I don't have to think about what's going on outside of work. Or maybe it's a hobby, and so you pour yourself into a hobby, seeking some sort of comfort and distance from from what's going on elsewhere in your life. Or maybe for someone, it's I'm going to search for love because I'm missing that and so you search for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright and it's Valentine's week and so maybe that's what you're thinking about if I only met that person then everything would be fine could we take a quick poll of the married people in the room Uh, was everything fine when you got married some of you men are like yeah because she's sitting right next to you right yeah uh uh-huh most oftentimes it brings a higher level of complication into life now I wouldn't change anything for the world But finding Mr. Right or finding Mrs. Right doesn't doesn't solve solve everything. We go searching for comfort in all the wrong places. So where are you searching? Where are you searching for your comfort? You're searching for it somewhere. Are you finding comfort that lasts? Are you finding a comfort that lasts? Or, I mean, again, I know you, you could drink enough that maybe it soothes the pain for a little while. Or you can pour yourself into something long enough that maybe it soothes things for a little, but you always wake up tomorrow, right? I mean, we'd, we do all kinds of things. It's just trouble is just waiting for you. And we can keep medicating and keep masking, but if we're not dealing with the root of our trouble, it's gonna keep surfacing. So where do we find comfort? There's a God who knows your name, who knows the number of hairs on your head, who wants to have an, a personal relationship with you through his Holy Spirit. He wants to know you on that level to comfort you. He alone brings that type of comfort that lasts. John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I mentioned that word advocate last week. It means comforter, counselor, helper, friend. Think about it, when you are going through difficulty or just living life day to day, you have God's Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have God's Holy Spirit inside of you. Every single moment of every single day, inside of you, wants to comfort you. As you might imagine, the word advocate also means that if you, uh, well, the, the, the context being if you got yourself in enough trouble, legal trouble, you find yourself in a court of law, you would have an advocate who is assigned to you or who you hire, an advocate who is there to advocate on your behalf, who's there to defend you, to counsel you, to guide you in those decisions. That's, that's the same context that the Holy Spirit is for us, to advocate on our behalf, an advocate in us. Listen to what else Jesus says, chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, He's talking about the Holy Spirit. I want to give you peace. And that's how we have peace, is through his Holy Spirit. He continues the second part of that verse. I do not give to you as the world gives. In other words, yeah, you go searching for comfort in the world, you're going to be left wanting. It's not going to last. Jesus says, I don't give to you as the world gives. His, His is different. It lasts. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Have you ever known someone who is uh, going through difficulty, trouble, um, and you, you watch them go through that and there just seems to be a, a peace about them during that time? 
And maybe not everyone, okay? But I bet if we think about it for a moment, we all know someone who has gone through some sort of tragedy and from close or afar or right there in it, uh, I have had numerous occasions where I have been a witness to someone who has gone through difficulty, through tragedy, and there's some sort of peace or comfort that just doesn't make sense. The only way I can explain it is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life that has helped comforting them through that situation in the midst of that. The Holy Spirit is, is promised as a comfort to us. Here's the second thought this morning, to counsel you. Another promise of the Holy Spirit is to counsel you. Anybody need some counsel? Uh, listen to what we're told about the Holy Spirit. Chapter 16, John chapter 16, verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you. Other versions say counsel you. He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come, to guide you. Now, thinking about my own life, there have been numerous times, I was going to say countless, but numerous times that I can recall where I didn't know what decision to make. Maybe n nothing stood out. You know, there were several good options or s all the options were bad. It's like, well, I don't know what to do about this. Numerous occasions where I've leaned into the Holy Spirit. I need some guidance, some counsel here. And I'm guessing many of you in the room could, could say the same thing. About 10 years ago, I was in a great season. I was the director of a nonprofit ministry mission work in Mexico. It was, it was great. It was, uh, it was something that we loved doing. Our family was in and out of Mexico a couple times a year. We were living in Missouri. I was traveling back and forth, or traveling around the country, trying to raise support. It was a great season for a young leader. But as a young husband and a young father, I was gone a lot more than I wanted to be gone. The pay was great. And I had, you know, meeting people all over the country, Christian, good, generous people who were supporting our ministry. It was a great, great opportunity and challenge for me. But again, I didn't like being gone. So I began personally just feeling some anxiousness about that and not sure what to do about it because I didn't know what else to do necessarily. Began praying about it, talking to a few mentors about it, talking to my wife about it. Um, I, I think I was just anxious about what, what next, you know, and got to a point where, okay, I think it's time to bring this season to a close and began praying about that. Well, God, if that's what we're going to do, if that's what needs done, then what next? Can you be lining some things up? Began talking to a few churches, ended up coming out here to visit in November of 2011. Had a great weekend here visiting this church and then went home torn about that experience and actually a few of you in the room know that I actually turned down an invitation to come here to Northeast Christian Church that that November a few things changed over the next few months had an opportunity to pick up that conversation again and was still praying about this all the way through God what what do you want us to do in this because I still a lot, a lot of any time that you're thinking of selling your house and moving your young family halfway across the country uh, that's a big deal some anxiousness, some fear, some unknowns, but those things all kind of got put to rest with a sense of peace about it. And about eight years ago, we moved out here in June of 2012. And other than a few other things in my life, like uh, submitting my life to Christ and getting married, making the decision to move our family out here to Grand Junction and be a part of this church is probably one of the best things that I've ever done. Or more accurately, one of the best things I've let God's Holy Spirit guide us in. Do you understand what's at stake when you try to make decisions on your own and you try to figure it out on your own? Do you understand what's at stake when you allow God's Holy Spirit to guide you, to have that counsel into your life? There's a possibility I wouldn't be here with you this morning if we made some other decisions. There are huge things at stake when we're praying about matters and considering, God, what, is, what, is, what, what would be best for my life at this season of life. Where should I work? What should I study in school? Where should I go to school? Uh, should I go out on a date with that person? Should I break up with that person? How can I fix this marriage? How can I get my finances in order? Should I take that business deal or should I turn that business deal down? Should I pursue athletics or pursue an education or both? God, I need your guidance your counsel in my life. We need God's counsel. Here's the problem. We often turn to Google for guidance more than we turn to God's spirit. 
right? I mean, something happens, and we Google, what should I do about this? Or what should I do about That's what we do. We turn to Google more often than we turn to God's Spirit at times. Isaiah chapter 30, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, but I, I think there's something applicable to us as well. Chapter 30, verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Can you imagine having such a close interaction with God through his Holy Spirit that as you go about your day, decisions just kind of line up. No, do this. No, you know what? You really shouldn't do that. To the left, to the right, whatever it may be. Can you imagine having such a close interaction with him that that's the type of thing that you sense in his promptings? Here's the third truth from the Holy Spirit this morning, perhaps the best for last, convict you. The Holy Spirit will convict you if you listen. You know those situations that you're in, and it's like, I I don't know if I should do that. Or I don't know if I should do that with those people. Uh, There's something that just seems amiss, something that just doesn't feel right. God's Holy Spirit will convict you if you're leaning into those promptings. Listen to the promise we're given about what the Holy Spirit will do. John chapter 16, verse eight. This is from the New Living Translation. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin. So he will convict of sin. When you feel God's Holy Spirit convicting you, sometimes it's it's because of sin in your life and of God's righteousness. He will convict that, you know what? This is the holy thing to do. This is the right thing to do. This is God's best. This is what he wants you to do. And of the coming judgment. I'm not a fear-based guy. The day's coming when Jesus will return, when we will all face judgment. We will stand before a righteous and holy God. That day is coming. So do do you allow yourself to feel conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life? Or have you silenced that voice? Any of you animal lovers in the room? Anybody have a dog? Yeah, a few, few of you, yeah. Um, Just envision with me for a moment, just imagine that you walk into the dining room and the lunch that you just prepared for yourself and you stepped out, now your dog is standing on top of the table eating your lunch, you know? What happens in that moment? Most dogs will kind of look at you and realize, "Uh uh-oh, caught conviction, and they will immediately cower and bolt, right? They know that what they did was wrong. There's conviction there. Those of you cat owners, right? You walk in the room and a cat is sitting there eating your lunch on the table. What does a cat do? A cat gets three or four more bites in, kind of looks at you and then runs away. Ha ha. No conviction there at all. That's how we know cats are of the devil, right? Right. Two Sundays, two cat jokes, okay? All right. But those of you, you laugh because you know it's true. Those of you who own a... You own a dog, you own a dog, right? You own the dog, and the dog knows that you are its, its owner. You own a cat, that cat owns you. Yeah. You are there but to serve the cat. That's how it works. When you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, how do you respond? Is it with, is it with regret? Is it with pain? Is it with, is it with conviction that, oh, wow, I, sh- I shouldn't have done that. I, uh, I, I need to course correct here. Or do you kind of, you know, bolt off, ha ha, you know? I'm gonna do what I wanna do. How do you interact with the Holy Spirit when it comes to conviction? You know, God, God does not convict to take our joy away, Okay? God convicts because he wants us to experience his best. He convicts because he wants to help us. He convicts because he wants us to, to live, the life his way, live our life his way, in his plans, to seek holiness. But we've got to lean into, we've got to listen to his conviction. Every time I've listened to God's conviction, I, I've had peace about it. Every single time, without a fault. And sometimes maybe it was I sensed God's promptings on the front end and decided to do something anyway and afterwards clearly felt his conviction about my actions. Other times maybe I I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you kind of got caught in a moment, didn't really realize it was the wrong decision and afterwards you feel that conviction of, you know, you, you shouldn't have done that. 
There was a better way. Either way, when I have leaned into that conviction, when I have regretted that, when I've course corrected, when I've repented of that, every single time I've sensed peace. And so my question, do you listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit or have you silenced that voice? Some of you might be sensing a different kind of conviction in your life here this morning. On the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit fills the followers of Jesus gathered together, Peter begins to preach a sermon to thousands of people who are there. And he talks to them about Jesus being crucified and how he says, you're, you're, you're guilty of this. You're responsible for Jesus being crucified. And it says the people are cut to the heart. In fact, here's what it says. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. That's Holy Spirit stuff. Cut to the heart. You've probably, many of you, been cut to the heart before. He said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? In other words, is there anything we can do to make this right? Is there anything we can do to be right with God on this? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we in and of ourselves cannot be drawn to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit who draws us in, the Holy Spirit who calls us. Now, I have experienced the phenomenon of teaching on a Sunday morning or in a different setting and afterwards been talking with someone and they say, you know, what you said today really spoke to me. I've got to make this decision in my life, whatever that decision may be. And as they're explaining what their decision is and what they heard me say, my thought is, I didn't say that. Uh, Wow. The Holy Spirit is capable of connecting some dots, of cutting to the heart at times in ways that we may not always understand says the people are cut to the heart after hearing the sermon. They say to Peter and the other apostles, what, what should we do? How do we respond to this? Is there anything that we can do? And what Peter doesn't do is this. Peter doesn't stand up in front of them and say, you know, a lot of people here today. We're kind of short on time. So uh, we're just gonna have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you have a decision to make, just want you to raise your hand. I see that hand over there. Oh, I see those two hands over there. I see that hand over there. That, that, that's not what he does. It's just, it's not what he does. And he doesn't say, um, you know, we're kind of, tell you what, let's, uh, I'm gonna say a prayer and I want you to repeat that prayer after me and uh, we'll, we'll call it the sinner's prayer. And that's what I want to do this morning with you uh, because we just, we don't have a whole lot of time. So that's what we're gonna do. Th- that's not what he does. He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for, the, for, the, for your children, for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. Now listen, I have, uh, there's nothing wrong with raising your hand. I've been in many worship services where someone was uh, giving a message and there was a call to conviction or a call to uh, make a decision at some point in there and hey, if you wanna do this, if you wanna be about this, please raise your hand and I've raised my hand. I, I love it when, when someone challenges me to step across a line to make a decision. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? I have sat across from people at a coffee shop or down here in the front of the room and I have led them through a prayer of repentance, a th- through a prayer of surrender. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are great, great moments between you and God, but it's not what Peter does here. It's not what he does. Now, another thing to keep in mind is when we're reading through the Bible, and uh, it's important that we, that we understand the genre that we're reading. And I don't mean, I hope I don't lose you here, but the book of Acts is historical literature, meaning that it is telling us about something that happened with real people having real conversations and real interaction. It's historical, about telling us about what happened. It's not necessarily prescriptive. So it tells us this is what happened on this day. It's not necessarily saying, the book of Acts as a whole isn't necessarily saying, this is how it must be done over and over and over again, okay? But Peter does something here, and it's almost as if he sensed there was gonna be an argument someday, someday, about this topic. Um, I made the grades in school. 
Some people called me a nerd. I didn't have a pocket protector, so I don't think I was a nerd. I played a few sports, so even though I made straight A's and all that, I, I wasn't a nerd, right? Right? I mean, yeah. So, but English grammar wasn't a strong suit for me, and I'm pretty sure that most nerds really love English grammar. I really didn't. But uh, I was pretty good at diagramming sentences. It's a lost art. I don't know if it's because it was linear or, or logical or practical or what, but diagramming sentences... And Peter does something here that I think we kind of gloss over. He parallels a few things that if you were into diagramming sentences, you would understand this. He parallels repentance and being baptized with forgiveness of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, it's almost like he thought there's going to be an argument someday, so we're going to make sure that this is clear. So even though Acts is not prescriptive, it's historical, when Peter says this, when he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise, this promise, verse 39, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God, our God will call. This is not a one day only sale. This is not a one, one chance opportunity. But Peter says this promise it's for everybody. This is, this is an all skate, okay? This is open to everyone. And some of you maybe haven't made that decision yet. Maybe that's the conviction that you're feeling today. Maybe you would say, you know what, I, I've been following Jesus for a while, doing my best. I, I do good things. I don't do bad things. I, I, I come to church. I read my Bible. I, but maybe you haven't Maybe you haven't taken that step of repenting or being baptized. I would challenge you what, are you, what are you waiting for? I want to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have the power and the presence of God's promised Holy Spirit in you. The world is rough, and you need the Holy Spirit's comfort. And this world is confusing, and you need the Holy Spirit's counsel. And this world is ending, and you need the Holy Spirit in you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul writes this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. There's a seal. What's the seal? It's the promised Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. That when you, when you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, when you submit your life to him, the seal is given to you. And someday when you go to heaven, you'll receive your inheritance. In the meantime, we're still here, right? I mean, we've still got a lot of life to live. We're still here. So how do we, how do, we do this? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? How do, we, how do we continue this life? In Galatians chapter five, Paul is talking about freedom in Christ. There's freedom in Christ. This is, this is life in Christ. And then at some point in the early part of of chapter five, he talks about this is life by the flesh. And then he contrasts it, starting in verse 21. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this, again, when he says live like this, he's talking about life by the flesh, life by the world, that sort of life. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit, so this is life by the spirit, this is fruit that ought to be Part of your life, if you are living by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. I learned patience growing up, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. How do you keep in step with the Spirit? Here's the takeaway this week. We're almost done. Four quick thoughts. Number one, repent. Some of us need to repent. Repentance makes room for the Holy Spirit in your life. You know what, I recognize that some of the things I have thought and believed and said and done have made you feel unwelcome, Holy Spirit. I repent of those things. So repent. The second thought, how we keep in step with the Spirit is to surrender. Throughout the day, moment by moment, to keep in step with the Spirit, we surrender thoughts attitudes, beliefs, actions, words to the Holy Spirit. We surrender thoughts before we speak them. 
And those words will become actions if we're not careful. So we, so we surrender that to the Holy Spirit. Here's number three, we ask. We ask for God's Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus said this, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we ask him. Many of you might need to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Finally, believe. 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 I think some of us still might be struggling believing that God's Holy Spirit power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available, dwells within us. That power, that presence is inside of us. It's promised. And so some of us may need to just simply believe that to be true. So how ought you respond today? What do you need to respond to? Do you need to repent? Do you need to surrender something in your life? Do you need to ask? God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, do you need to believe that that power, that presence is in you, available to you for comfort, for counsel, for conviction? What decision do you need to make? If it's repent and be baptized, our baptistry is ready today. Water's warm, it's cold outside, but it's warm in here. We could help you with that decision today. What, What are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized. We're gonna stand together and then we're gonna sing a song and then after that song, please stand up. Sorry, I could have phrased that a little better. Why don't you stand with me this morning? We're gonna sing a song together and then afterwards, if you have a decision to make, if you'd like prayer, I'll be down front. Myron will be out in the hall. There'll be people around, I'm sure. Uh, But talk to somebody before you leave here. Let's pray. Father God.